Among Us. Ocasio-Cortez got more than 5 million views on the streaming app Twitch. And she was truly lethal. We will explore this new kind of outreach and explain Among Us just ahead. Meanwhile, Joe Biden and President Trump took a more conventional approach to voter outreach, as they have, with campaign events this weekend. This week, the president will head to Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Virginia. Mr. Biden is off to Georgia. National polling shows Joe Biden leading by nearly eight percentage points. But in swing states, the race is significantly tighter. Voters in Texas have already cast 80% of the total votes cast in 2016. 80%, and we're still more than a week from election day. Today's Dallas Morning News had an unusual headline. Biden grabs narrow lead over Trump in Texas. Holding that lead would make some history. Do you know the last Democratic presidential candidate to win Texas? Jimmy Carter in 1976. But it's not just the race for the White House that's bringing voters out. Those down ballot races are also crucial. Senate, school board, the governor's mansion, everyone in the U.S. House, and more. 35 Senate seats are up for grabs this year. That includes both seats in Georgia. Senator Kamala Harris made note of that while campaigning in Atlanta on Friday night. That brings me to Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And Georgia, you gotta send them to the United States Senate. Send them to the United States Senate. Let them represent Georgia on all these issues. It is critically important. And you know, those, those Senate seats, those are six year terms. Think about your plans for Joining us now is Democratic candidate John Ossoff. He is running to unseat Republican Senator David Perdue. Mr. Ossoff, good evening. Hey, Joshua, good evening. They thought it was Stacey Abrams' year for the governor's mansion. Brian Kent pulled it off. He is now the governor. Why is this year the year for Democrats to take one or both seats in the Senate? Well, Joshua, this is really the culmination of a decade of work in Georgia, much of it led by Stacey Abrams. Recall that Stacey lost that governor's race in 2018, infamously running against the man who oversaw the election by just 50,000 votes. We have added more than 800,000 voters to the rolls since then in Georgia in just two years. And the new electorate, just like Georgia, is younger and more diverse. This state becomes younger and more diverse by the hour. And the turnout among young voters, among black voters in communities of color are all shattering all time records. But of course, voters in Georgia are continuing to face voter suppression and obstacles to the franchise. Talk about, let's talk about policy a little bit. With COVID-19, if you were in the Senate right now, what would you be working on in terms of helping Georgia deal with this pandemic. Some days it looks like the most powerful person in the Democratic caucus is Mitch McConnell and that nothing flows around him but that he permits it. So if you join the Democratic caucus, how would you help? Well, Georgia is the home of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. My state hosts the world's foremost experts in public health and epidemiology. And from day one, Our government's failure, our president's failure has been that this response has been politicized. They've failed to empower the people who actually know what they're doing. Even worse, they've suppressed the government's own public health experts, sent mixed messages, undermined science, undermined medical expertise. My wife is an OBGYN doctor here in Atlanta. The doctors and nurses have been doing their jobs. It's the politicians who haven't. So we need to empower medical experts, public health experts to lead in a public health crisis. And on the economic front, we need to get more relief to small businesses and working families who have been suffering without substantial relief from Congress since late summer. A recent poll from the New York Times and Siena College shows you and Senator David Perdue tied at 43 percent each. There's another poll from CBS and YouGov that shows you behind by just one percent or ahead by just one percentage point, basically margin of error in both cases, essentially statistically tied. What do you think it is that will put you over the top if you are successful? Is there anything that stands to give you the edge if you were to win this one? 
Well, there's no doubt that this is now the closest U.S. Senate race in the country. That's why Mitch McConnell has spent more money against me through his super PAC than any other Democratic challenger in the country. And what we've got to do, Joshua, is we've got to get out the vote like it's never been done before in Georgia. And we have to protect ballot access. Black voters in particular are being made to wait in outrageous lines. And they are showing incredible perseverance and tenacity in the face of voter suppression. But I need help from across the nation to protect ballot access in Georgia. And I need folks to get on to elect John, electjon.com, and send us $1 so we can defend voting rights and generate record turnout to win this crucial race. There was an op-ed in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution this week stating that Atlanta's murder rate this year, or murder count this year, is on par with Chicago's. We know that there were extremely intense protests after the homicide of George Floyd, including some that damaged the facade of the CNN Center downtown. We know that the Rayshard Brooks case is still moving. That was the young man who was killed by Atlanta police officers in a Wendy's parking lot. What is it that you as a senator would want to help Georgia with in terms of improving relations with law enforcement? Well, we need to rebuild trust between communities and law enforcement so that law enforcement can effectively do its job and keep every community in this state safe. And for starters, we need a new Civil Rights Act that will establish national standards for the use of force and that will equip local law enforcement not with weapons of war, but with the training and expertise necessary to do their jobs effectively, to keep us safe, and to build strong relations with community leaders and ordinary people, especially in the black community here in Georgia. Our constitution guarantees equal protection under the law, but when Ahmaud Arbery was shot to death in broad daylight in the street on camera, and local officials and law enforcement looked the other way, that made a mockery of equal protection. That makes it harder for law enforcement to do their jobs and it makes it hard for communities to trust those who are sworn to protect and serve. We've got to rebuild trust. And very, very briefly, what are the top three committees you want to serve on if you become a senator? Well, I've got a background in national security and foreign affairs, so I'd like to serve on the Armed Services Committee. I'd be interested in serving on the Commerce Committee, and I'd be interested in conducting oversight and investigations to root out fraud, abuse, and corruption within the federal government. John Ossoff, Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Georgia. Mr. Ossoff, thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. For more on Georgia's Senate races, let's continue now with Greg Bluestein. He's a political reporter with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Good evening, Greg. Thanks for having me. Thoughts on what we just heard from Mr. Ossoff? Yeah, it's interesting seeing his evolution as a candidate. When he first started running in 2017 for a special election district in northern Atlanta suburbs, uh, he had a more somewhat moderate message um, after he, he entered the race as a make Trump furious candidate, but then, then clung to a more moderate message. Now, as he's running statewide after Stacey Abrams' example in 2018, that you can be a Democrat who, who embraces liberal positions, and he's continuing to do so. And polls are showing that it's, it's working out for him. I mean, he's, he is right there neck and neck with David Perdue in just about every major poll that we've seen. Talk about that for a minute, because the fact that they are neck and neck, I think would give some candidates agita in a different situation. In Georgia, that's kind of a sign of progress. That means that his campaign is working. Exactly right. I mean, no Georgia Democrat has won statewide in a dozen years. So even the fact that he could be forcing a runoff would be major progress for a Democratic candidate in Georgia. And that's the rule in Georgia. If you don't get a majority of the vote, there will be a January 5th runoff. That's almost uh, a guarantee in the other Senate race that you mentioned earlier against Senator Kelly Leffler. But in this race, it's a little bit more up in the air, and very, very few polls show either of them hovering around that 50 percent mark. Touch on that other Senate race. Kelly Leffler is running in a very interesting special race. Among the candidates to unseat her is the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who's the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. What's the big story behind that race and who seems to be out in front? Yeah, right now it's Reverend Warnock. Um, he's about 30 to 40% in most public polls. Um, he has the full backing of the Democratic establishment. 
Stacey Abrams has endorsed his campaign very early, and he's got the money, the campaign organization um, that the other Democrats in the, in the race lack. So he's become the front runner. Meanwhile, Kelly Leffler and Congressman Doug Collins are scrapping with each other for the Republican vote, and they're trying to kind of outduel each other for the far right conservative vote in this because they feel like if they uh, going towards the middle doesn't make any sort of political sense for them. So both of them are out there with very scathing ads. They're mostly attacking each other rather than focusing on Reverend Warnock because the polls don't show him near 50 percent either. So they feel like they can kind of shift their attention to them to, to Reverend Warnock once uh, one of them makes it to the runoff in January. Why are there two Republicans going for that seat? I mean, Doug Collins is in a fairly prominent position in the House. He's the ranking Republican on the House Intelligence Committee. So it's not like he's a backbencher. Why haven't GOP Georgians coalesced around one candidate? Great question, and, and he was also the most prominent Republican, one of the most prominent, prominent Republican defenders of Trump doing impeachment in the House Judiciary Committee. Um, and it's a kind of long and sordid tale in Georgia politics, but essentially President Trump and his allies really encouraged Governor Brian Kemp to appoint Collins to, to that open seat uh, that, that was left naked by retired Senator Johnny Isaacson. But instead, the governor wanted to go a different route, pick someone who is an outsider from outside of the political establishment, and pick Kelly Leffler, who not only is she a former financial executive, but she also promised to spend at least $20 million of her own cash on the campaign. And so far, that tally has reached $23 million. So she's, she's abided by that promise. But it's really driven apart the Republican Party in Georgia into different camps. You've got very well-known Georgia politicians backing Kelly Leffler and others backing Doug Collins, and it's kind of been a civil war within the Georgia GOP. I'm sorry, I think I said Intelligence Committee, Judiciary Committee. That's what I should have said on the House Judiciary Committee. Before I let you go, what's if someone is going to trip in this race at the finish line, what are they going to trip over? That's a great question because more than two-thirds of, of voters are expected to cast their ballots before November 3rd. That's an astonishing number here in Georgia. Um, but most Republicans are still going to hold out for Election Day. So Election Day will tilt towards Republicans. So what we're looking for is Kelly Leffler and Doug Collins uh, in that race and then David Perdue in his race to continue to play to the base. And, and there's a concern that if, if they go too far to the right, it could alienate voters either on November or in a January runoff. It'll be interesting to see what happens with... I'm very interested in the Doug Collins... Uh, Kelly Leffler race. Interested in all the races. Georgia is just an interesting state politically as it continues to evolve. Greg Bluestein of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, you have one of the most fascinating political seats in the entire country. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we will check out what some first time voters are saying about this election and what's motivated some of you. Plus, how far does a fundraising advantage go towards victory this far into a campaign? 